So if I share this, can you see uh, this uh, the slide here? And bear in mind that I've got the slide on my screen right now, so I can't read any messages you're typing. You will have to activate your microphone and tell me something. Okay, so you get like the whole like slide. Great. Okay, so I'll begin. And if you have any questions, probably it's better if you interrupt me straight away and we'll talk about, you know, whatever it is I've just uh, presented. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to go on and on and on until I finish, okay? Because I haven't put any little kind of breaks in here. So if you have questions, you'll have to interrupt me and if I start speaking too fast and you don't understand you have to interrupt me as well okay because otherwise I won't know alright so uh, let's just make a start so th this is gonna be quite long alright so it's I want to try and do everything really okay so the first part is going to be a little bit I mean, about the basic virology of coronaviruses, uh, structure, phylogeny and replication cycle. And then what we know about the pathology of, um, well, uh, human coronaviruses, the ordinary ones, and then the more uh, pathogenic new coronaviruses. So just to put this in context, I'm going to talk a little bit about SARS and the MERS outbreaks and then that will be a kind of big long introduction into the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'll talk a little bit about epidemiology down here and then in the end uh, it's going to wind up with a discussion about antiviral therapies. Uh, what are the possibilities and what do we really know at this moment in time? Okay, so uh, coronaviruses, all right? So they are positive strand RNA viruses. And the coronaviridae order belongs to, uh, no, family, belongs to the nidoviral order. Okay, so roniviridae, mesoniviridae, arteriviridae, and coronaviridae, the related families. So roniviridae infect crustaceans, mesoniviridae infect uh, insects. Arteriviridae infect uh, vertebrates including mammals but there are no known human arteri arteriviruses and then there are the coronaviruses. So you know this is kind of tempting to wonder whether coronaviruses haven't been infecting you know all bilaterian animals for the last 500 million years or so kind of possibility. So amongst the coronavirus family, there are two subfamilies, the Taurovirinae and the Coronavirinae. And within the Coronavirinae, we got four genera, okay, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, and Delta coronavirus genera. So Alpha and Beta, they infect mammals, whereas Gamma and Delta, they infect birds. Okay, so human coronaviruses, like the ordinary ones, that's here, okay, the seasonal coronaviruses. Uh, there are four known human coronaviruses or subtypes, two alpha, two beta, and they're kind of named after the first type virus that was described in each one of these uh, uh, subtypes. And the new coronaviruses are MERS coronavirus, SARS coronavirus, and SARS-CoV-2. And just to be clear on this for everybody, uh, the virus, is, its name is SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 is a disease, right? So it's like AIDS, HIV. Now coronaviruses, a little bit about their structure. So they are enveloped plus strand RNA viruses. And the virus particles look like this on electron microscopy. So they've got a spherical particle uh, surrounded by this kind of crown of uh, spike glycoproteins. So their name comes from this, uh, well, you know, uh, morphology on electron microscopy. 
Now if you look a little bit closer or well in at least a kind of diagram form from uh, the viral zone run by my good friend uh, Philippe Le Mercier. So you see the structure of these viruses is pretty simple because there, there, there's one envelope like a protein, a spike like a protein for attachment and entry, uh, two integral membrane proteins, the kind of major membrane protein M and the small envelope protein E. So these are uh, involved in viral virion assembly and budding and the kind of the shape and the release of the particles. And then on the inside you've got the virus genome plus strand RNA associated with the nuclear protein. So this has got a helical symmetry so it forms a kind of like filament and then the filament is coiled up around itself to form a kind of like ball of ribonuclear protein that's inside the particle. So very simple, just four virus proteins in the particle. So for the replication cycle, well all plus strand RNA viruses kind of work the same way, all right? So you've got uh, attachment and entry. At some point the genome has got to leave the capsid so you have this decapsidation step to release the genome into the cytosol of the infected cell and then what happens is every virus has got to express its genes for plus strand RNA viruses one of the genes that they have has got to be an RNA dependent RNA polymerase RDRP so that's this triangle here so the RDRP is responsible for replication of the virus genome first into a negative strand copy and then into lots more copies of the genome plus strand RNA. So you have structural proteins and a load of copies of the, uh, the uh, genomic RNA in the cytosol, then they assemble and then somehow the virus has got to be released. So can everybody sit... Ah, okay. You can't see the you can't see the pointer. Uh, when if I move no, the. Ah, okay. Right. Yeah. So it's not going. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I th yeah, yeah. I think so. So, it actually actually doesn't show the kind of like uh, diaporama. So you never saw this, right? Oh yeah, yeah. There's some people. Yeah, actually, yeah. Uh, are they okay, that's it. So everybody's here. Yeah, look, is that? Yeah, because I was in like a diaporama, so I just could just see like my own screen. So, so this is okay now, right? You can see this. Yeah. And if I move down, oh yeah. So yeah, thanks for letting me know. Otherwise, I would have just gone on for like an hour and a half. Okay, so I was saying this, this is the plan, this is the family, and so I put the PDF on the Maddox, so any, every week you can all like uh, download it, I guess. Okay, yeah, so I was up to here, general replication cycle of RNA plus strand viruses. Okay, so I'm going to go through uh, these steps for coronaviruses, okay? Attachment, entry, expression, replication, and a little tiny bit about assembly and release. So attachment and entry, so this is the function of the spike glycoprotein. And so if anybody's got their mic on and better turn it off otherwise we might get a kind of feedback. So Okay, these different coronaviruses use different cell surface receptors. Okay, so the uh, the first one which was uh, identified was human coronavirus 229E, which uses uh, amino this amino peptidase CD13. Uh, NL63 uh, uses ACE2, SARS coronavirus ACE2, and MERS coronavirus uh, dipeptidyl peptidase 4 DPP4 CD26. Um, SARS-CoV-2 is just like SARS, 
and uses the ACE2, so the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 as the receptor. So this is one of the reasons why SARS-CoV-2 is more pathogenic because the ACE2 receptor is expressed in the lungs in pneumocytes which is not really the case for CD13 okay but on the other hand you see this human coronavirus NL63 also uses ACE2 as a receptor so that's not the only determinant of pathogenicity okay it's got some contribution why SARS-CoV-2 can provoke pneumonia but it's not the only thing okay so the first step is binding to the receptor then the virus is thought to, all of the coronaviruses are thought to enter the cells by endocytosis at this point the virus envelope has got to fuse with the cellular membrane somehow and this can only happen after pro proteolysis of the S glycoprotein so the fusion function has got to be activated after binding to the cell and after internalization in most cases so membrane fusion and then this is what releases the genomic RNA into the cytosol so let's have a little bit of a closer look about the S glycoprotein structure so the active form is a trimer okay so here you've got one trimer with each monomer a different color and you have to imagine that the virus envelope is down here and this is on the outside of the virus particle so this is the part that's going to bind to the receptor um, well another thing that okay so the the, the spike glycoprotein is secreted as a kind of precursor the S protein like a protein but the active form has been cleaved to form S1 and S2 domains so S1 is the part that's up here kind of globular structure which contains the binding domain and the S2 is this alpha helix structure here has got the fusion domain so this is kind of very similar to what you see in HIV, GP120, GP41, influenza, HA0, HA1. So all of these surface glycoproteins for these envelope viruses have got a very similar organization. The active forms are trimer, the receptor binding domain is on the top, that's the head, and the fusion domain is this uh, alpha helical structure here. And what is going to happen is that somewhere down here, FP, this is in red here, this is the fusion peptide. These are hydrophobic amino acids. And after this fusion domain is activated, then it's going to, the, these alpha helices are going to elongate. And the fusion peptide here is going to be projected into the cell membrane. And that's what causes membrane fusion. Okay. Right. So in order for this to work for the virus the fusion domains only got to be activated after binding okay and for coronaviruses it's a proteolytic cleavage which activates the fusion domain now uh, for the ordinary human coronaviruses both of these cleavage sites seem to be uh, digested by cathepsins which are in the endolysosome. However, for SARS-CoV-2 and maybe also SARS coronavirus, um, firstly, well, okay, for SARS-CoV-2 anyway, this site here, the S2 prime site, is cut by uh, furins when the virus is being uh, liberated from infected cells. And this second site here can be cut either by cathepsins or by a second protease, which is TMPRSS2 and this is present at the cell surface so for SARS-CoV-2 there may be an entry pathway which does not involve endocytosis in the endolysosome and this is going to be important as we'll see later on for uh, potential therapies okay so receptor binding and then somehow the this S1 S2 site's got to be cleaved by a cellular protease and that's what allows activation of the fusion domain 
and entry of the viral RNA into the cytosol. Okay, so let's have a little bit of a look at the, at the genome now. Okay, so as I said, it's a plus strand RNA virus. What does that mean? That means that the genomic RNA codes directly for viral proteins. Okay. So there are a lot of plus strand RNA viruses. Oh yeah, Baltimore class 4. Um, one thing that is really unusual about coronaviruses is the size of the genome. Okay, so it's like about 30 kilobases long. This is the biggest RNA genome for any virus. And it's unusual because generally speaking, RNA viruses have got a high mutation rate and the high mutation rate places a limit on the size of the genome because the longer the genome is the more mutations are going to be integrated at every replication cycle for the virus and if the error rate of the RNA dependent RNA polymerase is too high then that means that you can't have a big complex, complex genome okay so what this is what's called error catastrophe for you know replicating DNA or RNA molecules. So coronaviruses have, have found a way to get a bigger genome even though they've got an RNA polymerase and in fact they have a, a kind of a error correction uh, activity so the coronavirus RNA dependent RNA polymerase is also associated with an exonuclease activity which can correct errors. Okay so that's why the genome is so long. Now plus strand RNA viruses. Uh, what is uh, important about them is that the genomic RNA is actually infectious in cell culture. Okay, so if you've got purified coronavirus RNA, you can transfect that into cells and that will, that's enough to uh, act activate uh, a replication cycle. And it can do this because the ribos, the cellular ribosomes, are going to attach at the 5' prime cap here and start translating the first proteins that are coded at the 5' prime end of the genome. And in coronaviruses, these are two large polyproteins called, well, coded in ORF1A and ORF1B. So the polyproteins that are produced are going to be called PP1A and PP1AB. So what do you have in these polyproteins? You've got a whole bunch of different open reading frames. Well, one, no, big, one big open reading frame, so you've got a polyprotein, and they have to be released into functional proteins by the action of two viral proteases. So 3CL, which I think is the major protease, and the uh, papain-like protease, the minor protease. So most of the cleavage sites here are for the 3CL. So these proteases have to cut the polyprotein into functional pro uh, virus proteins including the RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So this okay, is going to be very important. Then a, a little bit further on in the genome what you have are different open reading frames coding for different viral proteins and each one of these is going to be expressed from a particular uh, messenger RNA. Okay, so that's the genome. So how does it work? Yes, yeah, so as I was saying, the first thing that happens is uh, once the viral genome, so normally when this is a, a slideshow, uh, you get these steps one after the other with a little bit of animation. So now I'm afraid you can't have that. So first step is you've got the um, polyproteins 1A and 1AB are translated. They're cleaved by the proteases the viral RNA dependent RNA polymerase synthesizes the complementary strand here in blue and then this double stranded RNA is used as a template to synthesize these uh, messenger RNAs. All of this happens in the cytosol and that means that the virus has got to have its own enzymes for adding a 5' prime cap here and adding a poly A tail to allow these MR, uh, RNA molecules to be uh, recognized by ri ri cellular ribosomes and translated. Okay, so that's gene expression. And finally, uh, for assembly and release, 
uh, the coronaviruses aren't released at the plasma membrane they're released in a very specific place which is the uh, uh, endoplasmic reticulum Golgi intermediate compartment which you can see on this very nice electron micrograph from about uh, 25 years ago so here's the rough endoplasmic reticulum you can see ribosomes stuck on here here's the Golgi complex with the kind of you know like a stack of pancakes sort of thing here and here you can see budding particles that are somehow really at the limit of these two cellular compartments so the virus buds uh, into the ergic right so the endoplasmic reticulum Golgi intermediate compartment and then the particles are in the Golgi and they get secreted out in outside the cell okay so that's pretty much all you need to know for the uh, uh, replication cycle so now we're go on, going to go on to pathology and uh, yeah, SARS and MERS outbreaks so ordinary human coronaviruses there are four subtypes and they are responsible for seasonal respiratory infections uh, they can, most of the time they're relatively benign but they can also call pneumonia, cause pneumonia or gastroenteritis in a small number of cases and when uh, you have children who are hospitalized for uh, respiratory infections about 10% of those cases are due to these uh, coronaviruses and now the population at risk for more serious forms are, are really very young children, elder, older people, people who are uh, immunosuppressed. It's not really that easy to, to find information about the normal course of the infection but I did find one study here published in 2018 uh, looking at hospital and community infections in New York about five or six years ago and then the date was published for more recently. So here in, in just this part of the slide here I've got numbers I've got the symptoms down here and the percentages are the percentages of the cases in the community you know that's children outside in the in New York somewhere and the and the and the symptoms found in children who are hospitalized in the same area over the same period okay so a normal kind of infection in children you know you'll get a runny nose blocked nose might have a cough in most cases mostly not fever and no wheezing so wheezing is a kind of like I don't know uh, sifflement you know during the breathing uh, may be related to uh, bronchiolitis so n no real uh, infection in the lower airways in most of the cases in in the community whereas in the hospitalized children you know only half of them have got an you know something uh, with the no you know a runny nose or blocked nose or something most of them have a cough most of them have fever and some of them have got you know more serious lung uh, symptoms uh, generally last like f symptoms last for four days to two weeks with about one week so in the children's cases like probably three quarters of them don't need to see a doctor one quarter of them will need to see a doctor and less than one percent will need a hospital stay okay so that's the kind of like general pathology for normal human coronaviruses and with definite seasonality more cases during the winter months okay so that's what you would or what, what, what you generally get so uh, unfortunately the new beta coronaviruses SARS, MERS and SARS-CoV-2 are much more serious okay what does zoom want to do for me are we already running out of time maybe so uh, <coughs> so for SARS coronavirus so this was the outbreak in China 2002 to 2004 so here you get you know an incubation phase about six days long so the incubation phase is the time between infection and the beginning of symptoms and you can find out what how long this is by tracing the event that led to a person getting infected so you have to know that date when the person got infected and when the person starts to show symptoms to have an idea of the incubation phase so SARS coronavirus about six days almost everybody had fever dry cough 
you know, myalgia, muscle aches, and everybody had lung pathology. So in this group of 144 patients, they had about 6.5% death rate. And uh, when they looked at the age uh, spectrum here, you know, you've got like uh, almost everybody uh, under 30 survived, and then you've got a higher death rate as, as you get older and more men uh, dying than, than women. So this was SARS coronavirus, you know, 18 years ago. It's very, very similar to what we're seeing now with SARS-CoV-2. Now a little bit about this outbreak, uh, because, you know, we have SARS-CoV-2, which has infected uh, millions of people in the world, but SARS-CoV-1 didn't quite make it. So what, what happened? So um, the, the, this outbreak was first notified in uh, February 2003. And the first case was identified in Hanoi. So these are actually the uh, the links here, and uh, you should be able to click on them and uh, see the documents if you want. So these are the World Health Organization uh, bulletins from 2003. So the first case was identified in Vietnam. Okay, so this was a uh, kind of weird, and and then there were multiple cases identified. Most of them were in Hong Kong. So we thought, okay, Hong Kong is the is the source of the outbreak. But uh, the health authorities in Hong Kong, they found their first patient, their patient zero, and it was somebody who came from mainland China. And so they said, hey, we got this virus from the rest of China. And then it was only later that China said, okay, oh, well, in fact, we've been seeing cases like this ever since November. So they hadn't actually told anybody about this at that time. So nevertheless, you know, so most of the cases were in Hong Kong in the south of China, and they were able to um, uh, apply you know outbreak control measures and uh, you know they had the last case in, in July 2003 but unfortunately there was a second outbreak in uh, Guangzhou in the south of, you know, south of China and then a second series of cases which were finally controlled in 2004 so overall there are about 8,000 cases almost 800 deaths and a case fatality ratio of about 10% so what you've got is a virus here that's less transmissible and more pathogenic and that was easier to control in fact because people got sick got very sick it was very easy to identify cases and it was easier to control the outbreak okay what about uh yeah something about the origin here yeah so uh, uh why do we n so we we know that the 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 origin seems to have been from a bat virus why because once the sequence was identified of the SARS coronavirus, you could compare it to all the known coronaviruses. And you can see the SARS coronavirus sequences are clustering very closely to uh, a, a bat coronavirus that had been identified. And that was true for all the genes. And it was also possible to get uh, SARS coronavirus uh, isolates from these cute little animals here, the civelle or civetta which were actually sold for food in these uh, wet markets. So you have this situation where you've got these uh, animals caged up in close proximity and they're alive and they've got infected with viruses and they can easily pass them on to the people who are in the market here. And then the virus is transferred from uh, those people to somebody else. And that's pretty much how what we think happened with uh, SARS-CoV-2 as well, because the origin the first cluster of cases was in a market like this in Wuhan. Okay, so MERS. Okay, so MERS uh, first case was identified in, in, in Qatar. And then ever since 2012, for the last eight years, there have been sporadic cases all over the uh, Arabic Peninsula, Arabian Peninsula, okay, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, uh, the Gulf countries. Um, once again, highly pathogenic infection. This time we got like a 2,500 cases, almost 900 people died, so case fatality ratio is about, you know, 34%, but very difficult to transmit between people. Most of the cases are people who are close, who work with camels, or have had contact with camels, and they get infected. And once again, it seems like the origin's really a bat. It's been transmitted to an intermediate host, and then this, from time to time, is transmitted to human beings. So uh, once again, once you look at the molecular phylogeny of the MERS coronaviruses, MERS coronavirus, the, the, the closest neighbor, its closest relative, is a bat virus. 
what is well a little bit interesting for people like me about this is that um, the the receptor here is CD26, and in fact the uh, HKU4 bat coronavirus, its spike protein was able to bind to the human receptor at a low affinity. Okay, so the affinity here is you know, 35 micromolar, and during this species transfer the spike protein is evolving to gain a higher affinity for binding to the human receptor but you know it starts with a low affinity binding so it can affect us okay and then it's just got to get a few integrate a few mutations and become a little bit uh, more specific for the for the human receptor okay so uh, that's kind of the background about the uh, human coronaviruses and these new uh, more pathogenic beta coronaviruses so this was a paper from three years ago before SARS-CoV-2 and it shows that in fact the human coronaviruses 229E, NL63, HKU1 and OC43 don't form a clade they're not a monophyletic group so that means probably that each of these ordinary human coronaviruses had a distinct origin okay and it looks like okay uh, H2 human coronavirus 229E where are we oh, it's here right okay it's got pretty close to another bat virus uh, this one hasn't got really any close relatives and these are the ones that are close to murine viruses so you know the origin of 229E might also have been transmission from a bat at some time and HKU1 might have come from a rodent okay so that's kind of the what we know about the origin of the human coronaviruses okay so now we're going to get on to the current pandemic how are we doing for time here 30 minutes okay fine everybody following this are you okay up to now okay great so I'll carry on okay so what do we know about SARS-CoV-2 uh, start with the pathology here okay so uh, these data come from a paper uh, I think it was in the New England Journal of Medicine they took a look at the clinical records of almost 45,000 confirmed cases from China so this is the clearest picture of like the pathology of uh, SARS-CoV-2 of COVID-19 so once again, incubation phase about five to six days. You know, 81% of those people had a mild infection, fever, cough, didn't really need oxygen. 14% classified as severe, so breathing difficulties. You know, breathing rate more than 30 per minute. This is something you can test yourself at home if you're worried about it. And oxygen saturation less than 93%. And then they had 5% patients who were critical. So that means acute respiratory distress or you might even have like septic shock and multiple organ failure so these are the people who need to go into intensive care and these people need hospital care okay and of course if you are you can progress from the moment you get a diagnosis you can either get better or you can become severe and then you can become critical and then you can die okay so what were the risk factors well being old and if you had some of these comorbidities diabetes chronic respiratory disease high blood pressure uh, maybe obesity is coming out as one and if you have a cancer so those are the numbers everyone is working on okay and most of these cases were from Wuhan and Hubei so maybe this represents already people who have got some kind of overt symptoms now if we look a little bit about the epidemiology here so on this slide we've got the numbers that I took at the beginning of March and the numbers just a couple of days ago this is the number of confirmed cases this is the number of deaths and here we've got the ratio of deaths to cases so at the first of March we had like almost 90,000 cases about 3,000 deaths about 3% ratio of deaths to cases and most of these were from Hubei in China 
and now we've got like 1.3 million well a couple of days ago about 70,000 cases deaths and the ratio is about 5% the one thing that is, is confusing about these statistics is that this number here 3.4% or 3 or 5.4% that's not the case fatality ratio okay so the case fatality ratio that's the proportion of people who've got symptoms someone who's sick right the proportion of people with symptoms who will go on and die so for uh, seasonal influenza this is going to be like about 0.1% or less seasonal influenza now when an epidemic is developing it's not really easy to uh, determine this case fatality ratio so for example if you've got a lot of cases and you have a lot of people presenting at the hospital people with mild symptoms you might not count them okay so you're not counting not necessarily counting all the cases and then you have an overestimate of the case fatality ratio or for example if you can't test everybody who's got symptoms so you can't confirm whether this is due to the SARS-CoV-2 so this number the confirmed cases number could be too low okay and then you're going to overestimate the CFR however there's another potential bias which is that you know at, at any particular point you're going to diagnose cases before people uh, go on and develop a more serious form and then die so this could lead to underestimation of the CFR so you can know this correctly, you know, properly at, at the end of, the, of an outbreak. So that's why we know this number pretty well for SARS and MERS, okay, because we know all the numbers. Now another thing that is kind of difficult is that um, when you break down the overall figures for the, for the world you, and, and look at different places, you have very, very different numbers for this ratio of deaths to cases. Okay, so these numbers are a little bit old now so this was like two three weeks ago so at that point what you could see is that the the kind of the base number here for like this 3.4 percent figure that was really heavily weighted by the number of people who had been infected in Hubei province in China so that was like most of the cases three weeks ago and most of the deaths so that had a big weight for calculating the over ratio of deaths to cases now if you looked at other pa places in China, you could see that they had like maybe a thousand cases, but really much fewer deaths. So with a ratio of deaths to cases like 0.6%, 1.7%, 0.1%. So, and then Italy, okay, at this point, now it was running at 7.7%, this ratio. So wh why are these numbers so different, okay? There's a couple of elements to the answer here. One of them is, okay, the, you can see that the ratio of deaths to cases is highest in the places where you have most cases. So Hubei, north of Italy, this is where the health system is under the greatest stress. There are lots of people who need to be taken into hospital, lots of people who need intensive care. And in that situation, the people with the milder symptoms, they're not counted, okay? So you have uh, more people with more severe symptoms and the people who die are going to be like a higher proportion of the total cases. The other thing that can happen is, you know, the health system can be overwhelmed and people who would otherwise survive, well, in fact, there's just not enough high quality care in uh, emergency care available. So you have more people dying because the health system is overwhelmed. So I think that is what happened a bit in, uh, in, in Italy. And that's why we're all staying at home right now is to avoid that situation so places with a lot of cases they have a high ratio of death to cases places who didn't have a lot of cases well here they could get one person and their contacts who came from Wuhan uh, they traced all of their contacts tested everybody so they can really count every single person who was infected even if they're asymptomatic or have very mild symptoms and then because they don't have very many cases then everybody who is really ill they can get good quality care so that means these numbers can stay pretty low all right okay so that's what kind of explains the the the, the diversity in the numbers and the, the difficulties in really understanding and calculating in the case fatality ratio and that's 
important because we want to know this to really understand how dangerous this virus is and how many people it's going to kill if, uh, uh, if we don't do something. So this is probably the best uh, data that I've found so far. This, were, this is from uh, just last week, I think, in The Lancet. So this is a group of epidemiologists and they're trying to take into account all these different biases. The fact that the uh, some places they might just be looking at the most severe cases, other places uh, the hospital care might be overrun, and and they might you might not know the outcome for every single person. So they try and take all, all these biases into account and give a the the best guess of what the overall case fatality ratio is likely to be, and they break it down for different age ranges. So overall, their headline number here is about 1.4% case fatality ratio. You know, so out of uh, 200 people infected, 300, two, uh, yeah, three people will die basically. Okay, but this is very, very different uh, by uh, okay by, by uh, age. Okay, so of course, you know, children almost there are almost no fatal cases. Uh, young, healthy adults know very very low risk and you start to get risk increasing from the age of about 50 and then they have a real big difference here if you're like less than 60 case fatality ratio they think is going to be about 0.3 percent over the over 60 about you know 6.4 percent and they also try to kind of calculate the case fatality ratio so that's people who are infected and who have symptoms and the infection fatality ratio so this will also count, you know, asymptomatic cases. And that's still, they reckon, you know, about 0.5%. So this, this is a number that's very important. So as you think France has got like a population, I don't know, about 50 million or something, and everybody gets infected, then that would be 250,000 uh, deaths or something like that, okay? If, if this number is correct and a very higher uh, fatality ratio in older people. So that's currently the best estimates of how uh, dangerous, how, how, how uh, severe this virus is. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, outbreak control and uh, what we're trying to do with these, uh, you know, with uh, the uh, confinement that we all have right now okay so in Wuhan and Hubei province they had this uh, lockdown people weren't allowed to move in and out of the, st the, the city everybody had to stay at home and just go to hospital if you had symptoms from the 23rd of February so uh, looking at the graph here it's about here okay so before that time you had this this is on a log scale the number of cases by the date and if you've got a straight line on a log scale that means you've got an exponential increase so 23rd of January they were in this situation where they had an exponential increase in the number of cases right? and if they didn't do anything in Hubei province they could have had like or in China this is the whole of China they could have had like 5 million cases by the end of February now that didn't happen because they were, they were able to control the transmission and then little by little, you know, this whole curve just flattens out. And now that now there are no cases in China with uh, endogenous transmission. All the new cases they have are imported. So that really worked. They were able to control the outbreak in China. But the story is not so great everywhere else in the world. So I, I, I prepared this graph up to here. This was up to the end of February, up to here, right? So these are the number of cases on a log scale by time outside of China and at this point we've got this kind of straight line here so we're in an exponential phase so I just thought oh, okay I'll just put a little line here uh, actually it might be up to here yeah so this is end of February and I go okay we might have a straight line going here we might have a uh, something like that so it was up here and so my extrapolation at that point time was you know if uh, we what we're gonna have is somewhere between 100,000 to a million cases by the end of March worldwide and it turned out we had about 700,000 cases uh, at the end of March 
So just by doing something like this, you get a good idea of where the epidemic is going. And of course, the, you know, the world population is like seven or eight billion people. So if we do nothing, there's a lot of infections that can still happen, you know, okay? So now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, epidemiology of transmissible diseases and this number R0 that you might have heard about because, uh, you know, this SARS-CoV-2, it's a new virus. It's not a virus that has uh, circulated in the human population ever before. And so it started off with one person getting infected. And when this happens, you have a new virus that arrives in a naive population. Nobody in the population has any immunity to this virus. Everybody is susceptible. So then what happens is, you know, each kind of cycle of replication of the virus, you get, uh, you get some new infections. And then people who have been infected, they can either survive or they die but in any case if you survive you become immune to the virus you're not susceptible anymore so the way things happen is that um, the next generation you will have this person has infected three other people so you've got three new infections four cumulative infections and need zero result infections this first person is going to be you know going to recover these three people they're going to pass the virus on to new people and then every cycle of virus replication you get more and more people who are getting infected but at the end you know the population becomes um, immune because everybody has been infected and the virus can't find any more uh, hosts to uh, for transmission so at the end the infection is going to burn itself out once it's infected pretty much everybody in the population so if you kind of put this on a graph just this simple uh, example with a population size of 100 individuals. So in blue, these are the new infections, the number of new infections at every cycle of transmission. The red is the cumulative number of in infections and yellow is the number of resolved infections. So you've got these three phases during the outbreak. You've got the kind of like exponential increase right at the beginning. You've got a kind of plateau phase here and then you've got the downward slope. And what is kind of worrying is this exponential phase here, this lasts till about, you've got about a third of the population infected here. And then you'll have another third of the population gets infected at the peak and then it comes down. So if you want, if you need to wait for the epidemic to burn itself out, then transmission is really gonna start to slow once about a third of the population has been infected okay so you have to you know that means that in order for the for the for, for this to play out then we'll have to wait till we have like you know at least a third of uh, the population in france infected like 20 25 million people and uh, then uh, uh, you'll have a peak transmission for another like month or two months and then finally we'll finish when we've had like 80 percent of the population infected now what is impacting the transmission rate of the virus is the number of susceptible people in the population and what are the chances for when the virus gets transmitted that it's going to be transmitted to someone who's susceptible or someone who's immune so this number you know oh let's see this waiting room okay come in come in Casson. come in I'm trying to come in. Yeah, okay, good. Right, so as I was saying, right, so this upward part of the slope here, how fast the virus is, uh, is, 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 is growing in the population, this is determined by the number called R0. And that's the number of new infections you get from one infected person at the beginning of the outbreak. So in my simple example here, okay, so I had one infected person initially, and in the next cycle, uh, we had like three infected people. So R0 was three here. And one thing that is simple to understand is if R0 is less than one, 
then the epidemic is going to die out. So the R0 number is very important for all these control measures because it determines the percentage of transmissions that you need to block in order to control the epidemic. So for SARS in 2002-2003 the, uh, the uh, estimates were like R0 was 2 to 3 for smallpox it's between 5 and 10 and for measles it's like uh, 15 to 18. So that means that if to control the SARS outbreak in 2002-2003 you just needed to prevent half or two-thirds of the transmission events. You don't have to block everything. Whereas for measles, this is practically impossible to contain. You have to be able to prevent at least 95% of transmission events. So it's impossible, right? This is why for measles, you have to vaccinate to contain this virus. There's no other way. Okay, so for SARS-CoV-2, well, what is the estimate? Well, initially the World Health Organization said it's about 1.95. I have really find it difficult to believe this because it's obviously more transmissible than the SARS coronavirus. Uh, currently, you know, this is the other studies have come along, so we think like maybe 2.8, somewhere between 2.5 and, and, and 3. So that's what, what the estimates are. But the range is pretty high, okay? Might be higher. Okay, so uh, what do you need to do to bring R down to less than 1? Well, there are two factors that contribute to R, okay, the transmission. One is the number of contacts each infected person has, and the other one is the probability that the virus is going to be transmitted for each contact. And you can try and reduce both these things, all right? So reducing the number of contacts, this is, you know, this is the isolation. Don't have shut down uh, bars, restaurants, cancel sporting events, don't have public transport open close the schools. All of this is reducing the numbers of contacts that we have with other people every day. And then reduce the probability of transmission, you know, wash your hands, uh, cough into your elbow, wear a mask outside, you know, this kind of stuff. And that's why you need to do both things. Because if you just do this, might not be enough. If you just do this, might not be enough. Okay? So it's a combination of um, interventions to really reduce R to less than 1 and the lower it gets this R number the f quicker the F outbreak will finish okay so if you reduce your outbreak your R to 0 0.99 well eventually the virus will die out but you're going to have a long period during uh, uh, of time during over uh, uh, during which a lot of people are still going to be infected Okay, so uh, the more you can do, the faster the outbreak is going to be controlled. Okay, so that, 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 that does it really work? Okay, so the uh, best thing I found about this was paper uh, from Journal of Medica the American Medical Association from February. And they looked back at the data from uh, China here, from Wuhan. And in the orange bars here, these are the number of new cases per day. And this is the lockdown, the 23rd of January, and they only had it like 400 new cases a day in China. So they, they, they intervened here, and then over the next like, couple of weeks, the numbers still went up, the new infections per day. But then when they asked these people, okay, uh, when did your symptoms start? When did you first start feeling ill? Then you got these blue bars, okay? So these people get a diagnosis when they're in the hospital and they get a test but they start feeling ill earlier. So this is the starting of the symptoms when it's closer to the time when people were really getting infected. So you can see that this lockdown situation here really had an immediate effect on the number of people who were getting ill in, in Wuhan, okay? So over the next week, they were kind of at the peak and then the number of people getting infected really went down. But you had a delay of about two weeks before these numbers started to come out up in the, in the figures because you've got a delay of five to six days asymptomatic of incubation period bef before people start getting symptoms and then you know people might stay at home for four or five days more then they go to the hospital or get a test so you might have like a 10 day delay between getting infected and actually appearing in the in the in the in the statistics 
but basically it works work really well and quite quickly okay so uh, uh, China it worked uh, really well and uh, uh, other countries uh, not so well so yeah let's just take a look at these because um, I put these so let's have a look see how we are uh, in France right now so worldometers has got like a hundred thousand confirmed cases in France 10,000 deaths if you look at the graphs it's always better to look at the log graph to see how things are growing so num total number of cases is kind of flattening out here total number of deaths starting to flatten out as well okay so we're kind of controlling this um, how are we doing in the states let's have a look at the states I'm gonna come up. No, okay. Come back. Uh, yeah. How are we doing in the states here? Okay. Let's have a look at the numbers. You know, this this curve here is still going up. Two phases. Ah, you can't see it. You can't see my screen anymore. Ah, it's not showing the right. Ah, okay. I'll tell you what I need to do. I need to change the screen. How about this? It's it's moving right. Yeah. Okay. So this is the states. You kind of got two phases, really, like exponential increase here, and then it's kind of going down. But the number of cases now they've got so many people you wonder if they're really testing everybody and if this number is right so the deaths I think that's a probably a better uh, indication of wha where their where their epidemic is going so because you're pretty sure that all the people who've died are getting counted this is not looking so great so far okay so this is still you know on a pretty linear trajectory here maybe slowing down a bit but you know it's not looking so good So uh, my advice to you is just uh, keep checking on uh, worldometers to see uh, how things are going. So I think really the, the big question for us here in France is how many people have really been infected by this virus? Okay, so we got 100,000 confirmed cases who have had a positive test for SARS-CoV-2 RNA and it's definitely it's, it's certainly an underestimate okay so there might be 500,000 people minimum who've been infected it might be a million might be even more okay and right now we don't know so if this number is like one percent or less then that's going to be a big problem to uh, um, to relax the confinement uh, measures uh, whereas if there's like more than 10% of the population in France have already been infected and recovered then okay things can you know we could start thinking about uh, easing off a little bit and current and so that, that's why there's a big discussion now about getting an antibody test screening people to see if you've got antibodies against uh, SARS-CoV-2 to see if you've actually been infected and had a mild uh, infection so we can actually know what this number is because that's going to be very important for guiding how to uh, relax the confinement okay, so that's kind of uh, where we are and the big question about uh, how many people have really been infected to decide what what can happen next okay so that's been about an hour uh, is it okay if I just carry on or do you have any questions great Right then, so I'm going to spend the last part, it might be about 20 minutes, on um, potential antiviral therapies uh, because, of course, if treatment could be more effective, then uh, that's another reason to relax the confinement because it would be easier to cure people and uh, treat them effectively. So this is a really big question, getting an effective antiviral therapy. So uh, I copied out this... Uh, infographic from uh, science so it's got the kind of different steps of the virus replication cycle and the different kind of drugs that could have an effect at these different stages so for 
the entry stage okay if you can block activation of membrane fusion by blocking this protein cellular protease TMPRSS2 apparently there's a molecule that can do this called camostat if vir the virus is entering by endocytosis then this is where chloroquine hydro hydroxychloroquine can act because they prevent the acidification of the endolysosome which is necessary to activate the cathepsins which will cleave the spike protein into S1 and S2 and that can activate fusion uh, then this HIV protease inhibitor lopinavir can apparently inhibit the SARS coronavirus and SARS-CoV-2 proteases and then there are some nucleotide analogues which can inhibit the viral RNA polymerase so remdesivir and I added this one on favipiravir uh, it's not in science but it's interesting to look at actually because there's clinical trial data on this molecule so uh, these are all molecules that are active in cell culture so this is a recent this is you know very fast publication uh, earlier this year they were looking at SARS-CoV-2 infection in a kidney epithelial cell line from uh, monkeys Vero cells so what they do is they infect the cells and then 48 hours later uh, in the presence of different concentrations of different molecules then 48 hours later they see how much virus has been released so there are two curves here the blue dots are for cell survival and the red line is for uh, the percentage inhibition of virus replication so you know remdesivir has got you know inhibits 50% of replication at you know one micromolar and pretty much the same for chloroquine so these molecules have both got antiviral activity in cell culture uh, one of the things that it's interesting to point out here is that um, okay the, 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 the paper that showed the role of TMPRSS2 uh, showed that uh, in Vero cells the main entry pathway is through endocytosis and th the fusion is activated by uh, cathepsins but that's not necessarily the case in other cell lines and it's not necessarily the case in uh, lung epithelial cells okay so uh, just because chloroquine works in cell culture on one particular cell line doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work in patients okay that's why the clinical trials are going to be important so anyway these are the different like potential antiviral molecules that work they can inhibit virus replication at uh, in cell culture so we have to try them out in, 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 in people so now I'm going to go through the clinical trials that I've seen and try and present the basic data about the trial the number of patients and this kind of thing and the outcome okay so it's going to be a bit repetitive but I, I think it's important so that you all get a feeling of how clinical trials are organized and what makes a clinical trial uh, valid and uh, reliable in terms of methodology okay so uh, this is a trial of uh, the lopinavir ritonavir so the association is called Coletra that's the, 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 the commercial name uh, so in adults with uh, you know severe uh, COVID-19 so this is a randomized open label trial so you know the doctors know which pa patients are getting the drug and which ones aren't and it's randomized patients got lopinavir ritonavir or they just got standard care uh, so these are patients you know they've got uh, confirmed SARS coronavirus 2 infection they have pneumonia on uh, on uh, radiography and their oxygen saturation is less than 94 percent so they're severe but they're not critical they need oxygen but they don't have mechanical ventilation and they had four weeks follow-up with uh, clinical and biological parameters so for these patients these are the results so the primary endpoint was um, time to clinical improvement so here's time here and these the this is the proportion of patients who got better so the red line lopinavir ritonavir the treatment arm blue line the control arm no significant difference okay uh, then they had via a virological endpoint so they found the viral load in you know the nasopharyngeal uh, swab sample 
and this is the time af after entry into the study and this is you know the viral load going down over time it goes down in the patients in the control group and it goes down in the patients in the treatment group so no significant difference so this was the conclusion from the paper no benefit observed with lopinavir ritonavir beyond standard care okay so negative result for this one okay next one favipiravir so this is a nucleotide analog it was developed as an inhibitor for influenza and developed by the Toyama Chemical Company which is a branch of Fuji in Japan and so it was developed as a uh, treatment for influenza and it's actually active against several RNA viruses so it's kind of unusual for antiviral agents because it's kind of like broad spectrum so that's why uh, it was used in this trial against Arbidol so Arbidol I had no idea what it was until I looked it up so this is an antiviral that is uh, commercialized in China and in Russia to treat influenza but it's not uh, uh, authorized in Europe or the States because we think that it doesn't actually have a, uh, uh, any, uh, enough evidence of efficacy so anyway so it's a nucleotide analog versus this uh, uh, other anti antiviral drug so here we are, this is, you know, uh, 240 patients randomized into two groups. Uh, half of them got favipiravir, half of them got albidol, plus, you know, uh, standard therapy. Um, most of these patients are, you know, you know, adults, and they at least have to have an estimated survival of greater than 48 hours. They didn't really have any viral RNA tests, and they followed up for seven days. So the end point was whether people got better, okay, whether they... Uh, their fever disappeared, whether their respiration was uh, was slowed down and the oxygen saturation uh, improved. So among the group of patients, okay, they're recruiting 120 in each group and the, the initial disease severity amongst those patients is going to be different, okay. So they stratified their patients into patients with ordinary infection or critical. So ordinary is people who've got fever and they've got lung lesions on their, their uh, imagery. And the critical patients, they have really difficulty in breathing, low oxygen satura saturation, and they've got lung lesions w which are progressing. And so the f they have more of these critical patients in the favipiravir group. So what they did was they analyzed only the ordinary patients against each other, okay, to avoid the bias in results because the the, the, the starting point of the patient groups was not comparable so then they looked just at the ordinary patients okay so in the ordinary patients this is a percentage of patients who recover after one week so a favipiravir group about 70 percent albidol group only 56 percent and this is a significant result okay so significantly better uh, improvement with favipiravir compared to the comparator group and this is another kind of example here this is the fever uh, whether uh, patients had uh, the fever uh, ha uh, w w was resolved on day one, day two, day three, and day four. Okay, so in the favipiravir group, and these are this is the numbers are a bit small because they reduced it to the patients who didn't have any comorbidities. So you know, f fever was resolved more quickly in this group compared to the comparator group, and once again, pretty high, significant result. That's one small trial from China, and second favipiravir trial in China. Um, uh, this is from the Third People's Hospital in Shenzhen. So this isn't really the big epicenter of the epidemic in China. So they had, didn't have very many cases, so they can't recruit enough people for, for the trial. Okay, So here they've got like two groups, one with favipiravir, one with Keletra. So Keletra, that's uh, lopinavir, ritonavir. Open label, non-randomized. So the patient groups aren't necessarily really comparable so you've got one group of patients with Keletra one group of patients with favipiravir it's a bias in the study so what's the inclusion adults with uh, confirmed SARS coronavirus 2 symptoms for less than seven days and they don't have the critical patients so mostly these are patients with mild infection 14 days follow-up checking uh, whether they get two consecutive negative tests 
with uh, the same standardized commercial kit which was approved by the Chinese Center for Disease Control. So this is going to be important. In order to have a valid comparison, you have to use the same test to measure whatever it is you're going to use for your endpoint. And then the second one was radiological endpoint, whether people's lung lesions got better or not. So here's the results. Okay, so this is time, and these are the patients who became uh, uh, who were still positive for uh, the viral RNA. So they start out everybody as is positive for SARS-CoV-2 RNA, and then as time goes on, some people you know, eliminate the virus. So this is the lopinavir group, and this is the favipiravir group, and this is significantly different. So, you know, they're faster. Uh, elimination of the virus in the favipiravir group. And then when they looked at the lung uh, imagery, patients who cleared their virus before seven days, most of them were improving on, you know, their lung, path lung you know, pathology. Whereas if uh, you didn't clear your virus for seven days, that was, f for, for more, if you cleared your virus s more slowly, then that was, you know, associated with worse uh, looking uh, imagery on the uh, in the lung okay so once again yeah we have positive results for favipiravir here in a small non-randomized trial okay so now we're going to talk about the chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine here so i don't know if you've heard about this one anybody everybody's heard about this right yeah okay study in marseille with uh, uh didier raoult so this was this is just you know from beginning of last month, recruiting up to uh, the middle of March, published just right at the end of March. So very quickly written up. So they have 42 patients, 26 in the chloroquine group with or without this antibiotic kit, which is azithromycin, uh, against standard care, open label. Okay, the patients and the clinicians know who is getting what, and non-randomized. And I have to say this is non-randomized in a very strange way because there are different sites. Okay, so most of the patients in the treatment group they're in Marseille, and most of the patients in the control group they are in uh, they were in Nice or other centres. And the number here, 26, is they recruited 26, but they don't report on all the data for uh, all of these patients in the treatment group. So the inclusion was adults and children over 12 years old. Uh, this is very unusual, okay? We didn't see that in any of the other previous studies. Mostly you do trials on adults and especially, uh, so this is unusual. And uh, they were all positive for SARS-CoV-2 by RT-PCR. So the exclusion criteria, just, you know, standard, preg no pregnant women, no drug allergies, this kind of stuff. So this was true for all the other studies, but I'm but in the Marseille study, they didn't really have any exclusion criteria relating to the severity of the infection uh, when they started the study. Okay, so that was kind of pretty open inclusion criteria. So they had seven days follow-up, and the virological endpoint was they had to become negative by P PCR in the nasopharyngeal aspirate. So this is the, the, the main result on the preprint here. So this is the time after the inclusion in the study and it's the proportion of patients in each group who are positive for the virus so everybody starts at 100 percent and as time goes on these curves go down especially for the chloroquine only group and the chloroquine plus azithromycin group becomes negative 100 percent at day five whereas the control group is kind of staying positive uh, mostly up until day six so this is you know they've got the p-values here are significantly positive. Now, uh, the reason that I would say most people in the medical community in France and in the world, I guess, including Anthony Fauci in the States, are not convinced by this is because of some of the things that are unusual in this trial. And you can see that because in the preprint they add like the data for every single person. And you can do that because you've got like a um, 16 in the control group and in fact only 20 in the uh, treatment arm so they included 26 people but they report data on 20 so there's six people missing four of those 
had a more severe illness. Three of them had to go to the intensive care unit and one of them died. And they were excluded from the analysis. So that's also kind of a, a because they didn't stay to through six days for their RNA. So you exclude the patients who have a worse outcome, which a lot of people think was a bad way to analyze data. So what are the other things that you can see here that are a bit unusual? Okay, so the as this Romycin group where you get the great result, there's only like six people in this group. Very, very small uh, group here. The other thing you see is that, you know, there's you've got these children up here as part of the control group. And they're all asymptomatic. Uh, despite what they say in the materials and methods, they actually included children as, long, as young as 10 years old. And we know that the infection is milder in children and we don't know anything about the relationship between viral load and symptoms in children. So just anybody with a basic idea about clinical trials, like even me, you know that this is the wrong thing to do. So these children here should never have been included in this trial. And you can't get any valid comparison from this group here and uh, the, the, the patients that are down here. So that's another thing that is really, uh, I'm, I'm kind of shocked, you know, because nobody ever does this. And the other thing you notice is that when you're talking about the PCR results here, you've got two different kind of results. Oh, yeah, no, one other thing, okay? So you've got the PCR results day by day. ND is not done. Okay, so for lots of times, like in the control group, the PCR isn't done on day one, not done on day three, not done on day five. But they present results for this. So, in fact, they explain in the paper so that they say that if the result was positive on day two, we said it was also positive on day one. Wow, you know, that that shocks me as a scientist. You know, you, you don't do the experiment, but you say you can impute the result. You know, it's doubtful. It's a doubtful thing to do. So the other thing about this is here you've got results that are a number in all of the patients in the treatment group and in most of the patients in the control group you've just got positive or negative now these numbers what are they anybody know what these numbers are uh, yep it's a CT so um, the higher it is, the less virus there is. And they say that for negative PCR, the CT value is greater than 35. Okay, so that's what the criterion is in Marseille. Whereas for these patients up here in the control group from Nice, from another center, they are not using the same PCR and they're not reporting the, okay, they're not reporting the results the same way. And to me, this implies that the PCR is being done in a different center, maybe with a different technique. And I know, technically, you know, these aren't. Uh, this isn't a standardized test. Okay, this is something new. Every vi hospital virology lab set up their own test. Sometimes using different pairs of primers, possibly using different reagents, using different extraction techniques, and this kind of stuff. So you can have a technical difference in sensitivity between two sites very easily. So imagine that the PCR in Marseille has got a little bit less sensitivity than the PCR in Nice. Just like you, so the same sample tested in Marseille might give you a CT of 36, it will be negative. And the same, and in, if you test it in Nice, it might give you a CT of 34 and it will test positive. They don't present any data about the sensitivity of their tests in the between the two sites. So as far as I'm concerned, unless you do that, you can't actually compare the results of the of these PCR analyses here. The whole thing is just totally not valid because they haven't validated the way they are measuring the viral load in the two groups of patients. Okay, so uh, this is my take on, on this uh, study. So I think, along with probably most people, that there are a lot of you know, big methodological problems here. They have pediatric patients in the control group, which probably should never have been done. They had four patients, oh no, left the treatment group. 
let's get this right here left the treatment group because of disease progression so you know how can you say that you have a favorable outcome to your treatment if you just exclude the patients with the most uh, unfavorable outcome and then you've got the control and the treatment groups at different sites and I think this has a potential to cause a big bias because the QPCR might have a different sensitivity and it's really up to the people in Marseille to prove that their measurements are actually comparable so for me I mean I, I don't think you conclude anything from this study I'm not saying that chloroquine doesn't work but I'm just saying maybe it does maybe it doesn't we just cannot know based on this data so a couple of chloroquine trials from China before I come and have summarize here so this is a small trial coming from uh, Shanghai once again this is a place where they didn't have very many cases so they only have a small number of patients here and all of them got uh, interferon alpha through the nebulizer so it's chloroquine plus interferon versus standard care oh. and interferon so you know once again adults only got positive uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 for RNA and they have mild symptoms okay seven days follow-up what's the result you know 13 out of 15 patients in the chloroquine group became negative for PCR 14 out of 15 negative in the control group so no effect and here is the kind of comments uh, from that paper uh, you know has not shown clinical effects in improving patient symptoms and in accelerating virological suppression and if the subject's condition does gradually decrease over time that means you know they get better over time even with no treatment it reminds us of the importance of conducting randomized controlled clinical studies so if you just have a single arm study then you might get a false result that is you think your drug is effective because but you just haven't tested it properly because most patients in your group are going to get better anyway so that's kind of a warning here and the last one I found uh, these are is a study of patients for, for in Wuhan uh, in February and here we had this is a randomized trial they say it's double blind in the in the preprint uh, no real details about the blinding but you know it's a randomized trial against hydroxychloroquine versus standard care a and adult patients uh, with clinically mild case cases so the endpoints here are time to clinical recovery so people they stop coughing the fever goes down and radiological endpoint so they get a look at uh, uh, the scanner at day six after therapy and compared to day zero see whether patients are improving or getting worse so here are the results okay so uh, this is the time to clinical improvement for fever and for cough so in the control group their patients improved after three days for cough or for fever after two days for the in the hydroxychloroquine so they were getting clinically better one day quicker and this is a significant result and on the uh, chest imagery okay so for looking at lung lesions here so these are the patients who are getting worse exacerbated so in the control group about 30 percent are getting worse in the hydroxychloroquine group you know, only two patients are getting worse and then for those who are getting better about half 55 percent in the control group 80 percent in the chloroquine group and once again this is a significant result so where are we as far as therapy is going so this is the table of you know all the papers that I've seen so far of actual clinical trials of these different different drugs I'll say okay so Coletra probably the best study in severe patients no benefit Favipiravir two uh, small clinical trials in patients with mild symptoms both giving a positive result chloroquine plus or minus azithromycin in Marseille well you know I give him my summary of this I, I don't think we could really tell anything okay whether there's been a benefit or not and then two studies of chloroquine in China um, one with no evidence of benefit one with a positive result and what you can say about the, the first trial here in Shanghai is everybody got the interferon therapy so maybe you know there's no added benefit of chloroquine if you give anybody everybody interferon 
So uh, that's where we are now, and I don't think anybody knows what is really the best therapy that's going to be the most effective for uh, for uh, treating patients. So the uh, big European clinical trial, as far as I know, is recruiting in like four or five groups. So they're going to be testing standard therapy versus Coletra versus Remdesivir versus Coletra plus interferon and hydroxychloroquine as a like extra group so we'll get data on this from France from Germany uh, well in the next couple of weeks okay so here's my summary I'm kind of winding up now uh, so structure of virology okay oh envelope virus yeah this is very important so uh, envelope viruses have a, um, uh, a lipid membrane so uh, that's why you can easily inactivate them just by washing your hands with soap that's why hand washing is effective uh, the normal human coronaviruses can be alpha or beta uh, the new one SARS-CoV-2 is a beta coronavirus replication cycle different steps of the replication cycle can be inhibited by different potential antiviral molecules uh, pathology okay basically you know all of this and for the current state of the pandemic so the case fatality ratio is affected by the number of cases and what everybody is trying to avoid is having so many people sick arriving at the hospital and the uh, emergency care intensive care units that uh, they're going to be overloaded people aren't going to have enough mechanical respirators and then you'll get a higher case fatality ratio because this case fatality ratio that we actually have now okay 1.5 percent this is when everybody gets good clinical care okay if everybody can't get good medical care well your case fatality ratio is going to go up all the five percent of people who are in a critical set, uh, situation they will all die so that's why controlling transmission has been the key to saving lives and my last uh, slide here is uh, of uh, this guy dr li wenyang who was one of the people who first warned his colleagues about the outbreak and uh, f the only thing that happened to him from his hierarchy he's got uh, warned uh, not to spread uh, bad rumors uh, by the public security bureau of Wuhan and uh, he got told off they told him to keep it quiet uh, unfortunately he was infected by the virus and died at the beginning of February just at 33 years of age poor guy so there's a real risk of infection and death for the clinical teams involved and I hope everybody goes out at 8 p.m. to give them a clap. So that's the end of my uh, presentation. So if you like, I'll stop the uh, screencast and we can have a discussion. I'd be very happy if you have any questions.